All right, we're recording. So welcome everyone. Here we are in April already. Um, I'm just going to get right into it here. We've got a full meeting as usual. So these meetings are recorded. Uh, just please keep yourselves uh, muted unless you need to speak up. Um, the recordings are available, all of them uh, since August of 2020 are available at this location. The meetings are every third Thursday of the month, 2.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon. The Zoom link is always the same. So just st store that away if you like and use that every time. Um, I send an email out a week prior and then on the morning of these meetings. Um, these are pretty much open to anyone who wants to attend. Um, but if you would like to be on that email list, if there's anyone on the call today who is not receiving those email updates for these meetings and other things, other Enviro DIY and the Delaware River Basin topics, please feel free to be in touch with me and I'll put you on that distribution list. Um, <clears throat> just as a reminder, the attendees here in, are primarily folks who are working in the Delaware River Basin, specifically working in association with the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, um, but lots of folks who are just working in the DRB but are not um, specifically with the, the DRWI. And then there are folks outside the DRB that are attending as well. Um, <clears throat> We're supporting this work via the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, as well as uh, the Consortium for Scientific Assistance to Watersheds, which is a PADEP Growing Greener grant. So here is the website, fourstatesonesource.org for the DRWI. Feel free to check that out if you'd like more info. This project, this Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin is a small component of the DRWI. Uh, and then Seesaw, you can go to this site if you want to know more about that. This is only Pennsylvania, um, so, but Stroud Center is able to provide, um, you know, workshops and assistance to Pennsylvania watershed groups via this uh, Seesaw funding. So feel free to be in touch if you have sort of um, bigger educational or monitoring instruction needs, and we can uh, work with you on that. Um, so just as a review, goals for these meetings, it's really just a time for us to check in and do some presentations, ask questions, report issues, et cetera. We do provide uh, specific updates from the Stroud Center, usually focused around Enviro DIY, but sometimes broader. Um, and then we have the main uh, focus is often these presentations and we have presentations from station owners and managers as well as um, certain topic presentations like today, uh, Diana Oviedo Vargas, who is a researcher at Stroud Center is gonna talk about uh, some of the analyses we've been doing internally on the continuous data from across the DRB. Um, Folks that are kind of involved with Enviro DIY in the Delaware River Basin, myself, Rachel Johnson, a lot of you know her. She does a lot of field work, um, just providing technical support on these stations and trainings. Krista is with the Muscanet Kong Watershed Association and uh, part time with the Stroud Center, and she's more uh, in the northern part of the basin and is available to assist up in that region. And Shannon Hicks, who is the um, really the source of these stations, the designer of the Mayflies and the designer of the Enviro DIY monitoring stations. And then there's uh, our two master watershed stewards who are just kind of consistently involved in um, providing support and mentorship and such, Carol Armstrong and George Seeds. And then the Stroud Center DRWI leads are Dr. John Jackson, Matt Earhart, and Dave Arscott, who's the executive director at the Stroud Center. Um, so regarding the uh, data that are being collected across the DRB from these stations, these con this continuous data, 
the Stroud Center, from the Stroud Center perspective, our primary goal continues to be to support users in um, using the stations for their own purposes. Uh, in support of that, we are doing internal analyses and developing tools um, to help folks use the data and uh, tell stories with the data, interpret the data, and uh, communicate the data. So um, today's agenda, we've got Stroud updates, we've got presentations. I'm going to go through some of the winter storm chloride and conductivity preliminary results and show some rating curves. And then Deanna is going to do um, a presentation on uh, the analysis of the DRB continuous data. And then we may have a little time for discussion. Um, so updates. OK, so the Enviro DIY manual has been updated and has a new searchable format. So hopefully it will be more usable for folks, more accessible. Uh, the way you get to the manual is go to envirodiy.org and then click on this Mayfly tab and then go to the bottom here for the monitoring station manual and appendices. And what that gets you to is the manual, and this is the direct link to the manual, uh, is a knowledge base now. Um, it's a little different format. And so you can search the manual from right here. This is the screen that you'll see when you go into the manual. So you have the main manual here, the sections, and then you've got all of the different appendices here. And you can just click in these and then they have additional clickable items inside there. You can give feedback on the manual. And um, if you get, want to give even more feedback on the manual, it will, it will direct you to the Enviro DIY forum where you can give additional feedback if need be. Uh, additionally, we wanted to let folks know that the meter group has released um, or ha it is, ma is making available now the uh, next generation, generation two Hydros 21 CTD sensors. Uh, you can see here that it looks a little different than the previous version. This uh, slot where the um, that used to be on the side is now on the bottom. And you can see here those conductivity screw heads. So maybe a little more challenging to screw those, but they're also going to be more protected. So they may not need as much cleaning. Um, we haven't really gotten to test this very much. The first we're really going to see of it, Shannon's been testing it, but uh, the workshop that we're doing um, next week is the first that we've really kind of uh, worked with others on this sensor. So hopefully that goes well, but all indications are that it functions just as well, if not better than the previous version. The, the pressure transducer is supposed to be less vulnerable to damage. Uh, that's one thing in particular that seems it's going to be a lot better on these. Um, the new Mayfly version 1.1 is available on Enviro DIY in the shop there and on Amazon. Same thing with the Enviro DIY sellboard. As, as you all, I think, probably know by now, this is a sellboard that Shannon designed because the manufactured cell boards were not working very well for us. So she designed this to go along with the Mayfly board that she designed, the new version 1.1. So those are both available on the Enviro DIY shop and on Amazon now. Um, just a reminder to, if you have significant um, field issues with your station, feel free to um, uh, fill out this Enviro DIY service request form. It will ask you for um, a, a number of different pieces of information that you'll uh, provide so as to let uh, us, primarily Shannon and Rachel, do some uh, desktop sleuthing prior to setting up a assistance visit. So feel free to use that if you need assistance on any of your stations. And just a reminder that there's a lot of different resources available at this site here wikiwatershed.org slash DRWI. And um, if you don't remember that, you can just go to Wiki Watershed and click on this tab here, DRWI tab, and it'll take you to this um, web page with all of these different resources. So this is where you can get data sheets for, down, for, for printing. You can enter your data sheets here. 
Uh, there's the quick guides, the, the maintenance and QC quick guides. There's, um, this is also where all of these um, workshops are, uh, the video recordings are housed there. there are lots of different resources there. Um, okay. And that is it before we move on. Any questions at this point? From anyone? Yeah, well, uh, do, can we expect those uh, sensors uh, by next week or not? For the workshop, you mean? Yes, they are supposed to. I mean, you should definitely check in with them and make sure that they're on track to get it to you on time, Jim. But they, as far as I know from Shannon, and Shannon, please chime in, but as far as Shannon has um, been informed, they were on schedule to have those sensors to everyone who is attending the workshop next week by the workshop date of April 27th. So, um, but I would encourage you, Jim, to just check in with them to make sure that they are on track with that. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I did check in and uh, they said any day now. So I don't have positive assurances yet. Okay. I mean, I've ordered, they got my money, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I ain't here yet. Well, hopefully that's the case. If we have, if the bulk of people don't have it by day, don't have the sensors by day two, the 28th, then we may have to <laughs> do something. I mean, they, we coordinated with them on this workshop. So they're, so we're supposed to be, everyone's supposed to be receiving the sensors by then. So hopefully that does come true. Anyone else? So David, worst case uh, scenario, if it doesn't come true, could we at least set up the system, start it up with um, the old sensor? Um, you mean you have an extra sensor? I, I have a, another CTD sensor. Yeah, I mean, that, that's your call, Rob, if you want to, you know, you're pretty experienced with it. So if you wanted to just put on one of your old sensors, you can certainly do that. Um, I don't know, Shannon, if you have any comments on that. No, that would be fine. I think the problem is that the majority of the people attending the workshop do not already have a, a sensor. So um, we'll just have to take a tally, you know, like, Tuesday afternoon or something, if it looks like they aren't going to arrive. But uh, the folks at Meter Group had told me that uh, they 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 were going to have the sensors in the attendees' hands in time for the workshop on Wednesday, even if that required uh, expedited shipping, which Meter Group was going to cover the cost of that. So they they know when people need them, and they said they were going to do their best to have them there. However they needed to accomplish that. So I'm waiting to hear back from them. I think they're, um, my main sales contact there at their company is out this week. So I'm gonna have to try to reach um, some other people to find out, but otherwise maybe Monday before I hear uh, definitively from um, from them about about the, the status of all that. Good. Shannon, and I, I ordered- Sounds good. And I said that they're going to to me, but it sounds like they're shipping it this. No, they no, they no, they they have the list of all seventeen sensors that need to be shipped out to workshop participants, and they will be coming to your your house, your individual house, and not Stroud. We we've ordered thirty of our own sensors for our own projects, so we're expecting a big shipment also. But we don't need them in time for the workshop. But each each person who ordered one will get one at their residence or place of business or whatever shipping address you, you put into there. Uh, they usually use FedEx with most of their shipments. So um, that might give people a heads up of which which truck to be on the lookout for when they come to your house. But that's that's the plan, I think. OK, thanks. Yep. Anything else? OK, I am going to move on then and talk about 
some of the winter storm results, salt flush results that we got from the winter. Um, primarily, I'm going to talk about the uh, chloride conductivity rating curves that folks who were collecting samples across the Delaware Basin uh, put together. And then Deanna is going to go into her talk. So uh, if folks remember, there was a subset of groups, uh, mostly uh, folks that were working in urban areas, who um, received some grab bottles and labels uh, to go out during winter storm, during and after winter storms to collect grab samples, to measure chloride using these strips, and to measure conductivity, either using the CTD uh, sensor associated with the monitoring station or a handheld meter if for whatever reason their station was not live or was not working at the time. Um, so these grab samples will be analyzed not only for chloride, so we'll have two chloride values, but also they'll be analyzed for um, various uh, cations, um, primarily ones that we're concerned with this being uh, magnesium, calcium, and potassium, ones that are associated with uh, different types of road salt. So the samples are being still being processed. It takes a while, um, but we do have chloride test strip data because when they folks went out and collected grab samples, they also did test strips, and those results appear immediately. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at today is the chloride data and the conductivity data and how those relate. So what we have, I can advance the slide. There we go. So this is what they did. Um, so you're collecting samples. You can collect samples at base flow. But these are the ones that we were really trying to get is when there was a conductivity spike, meaning there was road salt uh, flushing into the stream and raising conductivity and trying to get grab samples and chloride strip measurements and conductivity readings at these points. So describing what the um, conductivity and salt levels look like um, during these salt flushes. And then also potentially getting some readings of conductivity and chloride strips during these dilution events to just really, uh, so you re we can really understand that whole distribution. Let's see, we've got someone who needs to be muted. There we go. Um, okay, so yeah, so in these humps, in these spikes, we were collecting a grab sample, a chloride strip reading, and a conductivity reading. And then during the dilution events and base flow, taking just chloride and conductivity readings. This was based, this was the reason to get the grab samples in this time was simply to just um, you know spend the money at the times whenever we're getting the most important information, which is when there's spiking um, conductivity conditions. Okay, and this is so to be clear, this y-axis is conductivity and this x-axis is time. So road salts start, snow starts melting, ice starts melting, water starts running off of the surface and carrying salt in and co causes conductivity and salt levels to go up. And then at some point it goes down and sometimes there's still water running off and you get dilution. This is sort of a generic pattern and the patterns obviously like are gonna vary stream to stream and event to event. Okay, so this was the kind of the idea here of collecting samples in, during single events and over multiple events. So getting samples at base flow and during dilution events, then getting samples during these spikes and potentially getting during spikes over in multiple events. And that's what folks found is you can go out in one event and get maybe a sample or two before it gets dark, but you see the salt is still washing off overnight, but you're not going to be out there at night, so you don't get the peak on that storm. The next storm comes about and it spikes during the middle of the day, so you're able to get out there right when it peaks. That type, that type of process is what these groups were going through. Um, so I'm going to now just go through 
the results. So this is an example spreadsheet. This is one of George Seed's spreadsheets. George did a really nice job on five different streams in Westchester. Um, he and I teamed up on that and he did most of the work. Um, but this was Taylor run. And so what this is indicating is a conductivity value. There's five different times that George got conductivity readings. You can see the different conductivity levels and he got a different chloride number via the chloride strip at each of those different times to go along with the conductivity data. And then he recorded his grab sample numbers. And here he didn't collect samples for these ones because they were during dilution and base flow events. So he elected to just do the chloride strips in those and the conductivity readings. So then to do a rating curve, then you basically just plot this column against this column and you get this. Now I have Taylor, I should have organized these a little better. I have Taylor in here somewhere. This is another one of George's streams. Um, but this is, this is what you get, chloride on the, on the Y, conductivity on the X, and you can see this is a nice linear relationship. You can see here the slope is about uh, 0.35, and a very good R squared, which is expected. Generally, it seems like you get pretty good R squared. You can see the, the chloride ranged up to about 700 for this. Um, as we know, um, you know, our chloride chronic criteria are down in here. The EPA uh, acute criterion is up here 860. So none of these samples exceeded that acute criterion. The Canada criterion is 640, acute criterion is 640. So you can see that top sample probably exceeded that. Um, point being though, you know, it's a gradient. So there's gonna be acute effects uh, regardless on certain sensitive organisms. And then there's gonna be chronic effects when you get into these levels that the stream hangs out at for long periods of time. So um, I wanna leave some time for Diana. I've got quite a few uh, curves here because people did a fairly good job this winter. I'm just gonna roll through these and we can just take a look. Note the slope on these and note the ranges that we're seeing on the X and Y axes. So this was one where another one that George did, and you can see here that he maxed out the high range chloride strip. Those go up to about 6,000 chloride, and yet this stream was so high that it did not even get there. So it kind of, you can see that this trend is going up this way, but then this Thing maxed out, this one maxed out at six, so you weren't even able to get the measurement that should probably be up in this region. So what I did is just went with this trend and then plotted this site according to what the conductivity value according to this equation would dictate. And it puts it all the way up here at about 12,000 milligrams per liter. So you can see this site is, you know, the bugs and uh, biota in this stream are probably not doing so well other than the ones that are tolerant of salt because these measurements are far exceeding acute criteria. So here's Taylor Run. You can see this is a little more reasonable for an urban stream, but you can see that it's approaching those acute limits. Good correlation here. Again, we're in the 0.3 range of the slope. Um, this is Goose Creek, which has a little bit of a different kind of um, chemistry, it seems. It seems like there's a, 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 some concrete uh, weathering that is maybe contributing to some of the con high conductivity values here. But again, we see a very good relationship. This is another one in Westchester. Not quite as tight, but again, in the sort of same slope range. This is um, just a couple samples that, that uh, the folks, uh, the Nature Conservancy got in Upper Rocky Run. Um, you can see that they're pretty high chloride. This, this is not representative of their full rating curve. They have a, a more well-developed rating curve based on other data. Um, you can see even with two points, you're sort of getting that, that upward relationship. This is another one from, First State National Historic Park with the 
uh, Delaware Nature Conservancy folks. Um, this is one that is in a less urban area. This is up in Berks County. Um, some of the master watershed stewards up there in Berks County developed this. And this, although this is much lower, this was actually, they did very well in maxing out. Um, this was about the maximum conductivity level that they observed the whole winter here. So they really got the full range of values that they uh, saw this winter in, uh, in salt spikes there. Slope still looking about the same, a little bit lower. Um, this is Pollen's Kill up in northern New Jersey. Can see going way above some of these acute limits. Tonic conductivity above 10,000. Uh, this is at the Sussex County Community College on the Pollen's Kill, the very headwater of the stream. Um, this one lower, but I think this did get some higher conductivity spikes. But um, see a good relationship there. Um, here's in Pennypack right outside of Philadelphia. Again, approaching some of these acute limits. And they did a nice job too. I think this was pretty much the max of the spikes that occurred in Pennypack. So they managed to get several samples at the peak of those conductivity spikes. This is Shoemaker Run. This one is, this one is the the real, this is the, this is the highest conductivity we've yet seen in the DRB. Um, this, what is shown here, is not even half of what it got to this winter. This site got to over 100,000 conductivity this winter. So you can see that that probably is getting up, is going to get up to 30, 30,000 milligrams per liter of chloride. So it's like twice as salty as ocean water for short periods of time in that stream. Just a few samples, most of the samples that were there, they couldn't even be measured with the chloride strips uh, because they didn't measure high enough. The high range chloride strips. Pickering Creek, again, uh, nice, Car this Carol Armstrong, um, this again, this is one of those streams that doesn't get super, super high. Um, so this was getting up towards the top end of where it spiked, I believe. I think it does get a little bit higher than that, maybe into the thousands. But again, sort of seeing that same general kind of relationship. Another Pickering one, this is a little, this is the least um, correlated, R square of 0.7 here. So, you know, kind of calls into question what's going on there. Um, you know, if the strips were maybe outdated or something, or if there's just something different going on with, with the actual water chemistry there. And so that's what I have for the conductivity chloride rating curves. Um, we are at 301, and I'd like to give Deanna plenty of time. So why don't we hold questions on the rating curves until after Dion is done, and then we can just have a general question period um, if need be. So Kevin, keep the um, keep your question keep your question for then. I see it in the chat. Um, so Diana is a researcher at the Stroud Center. Uh, she's going to do this presentation, a multi-factor index to describe water quality using continuous data in the DRB. This is sort of a pilot study we're doing to kind of explore this idea of assembling continuous data into metrics and that can then be assembled into a broad index that describes overall condition of the site based on uh, the continuous data. Um, so I will stop share and Hopefully, Diana is ready at this point. She was having a, an a I'm ready. important call come through. Okay. All right. Do you want to, are you good to go, Diana? <clears throat> yeah, I'm just trying to share my screen here. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead and share. This is right. <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay. I don't know what I'm sharing. Is it the full screen yet? No. Nope, you're in the just the regular editing version. How about that? Not yet. No. Nope. Now you're good. Okay. Right. Thanks, Dave. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, like they were saying, this is um, it's it's a it's a pilot work. Um, like you'll see later, there is a uh, big disclosure there or um, reminder for everybody that this is just like the initial thoughts, I guess, about the the development of um, some sort of index or compiled metric that. Um, would allow us to somehow summarize uh, the you know um, giant data sets that you guys are generating. Um, so I did something with my screen. Okay, <clears throat> so like um, I was saying, what we would like to do is to be able to provide uh, the community with, with a simple but representative and robust indicator of water quality conditions at the monitoring station. Um, I forgot to say something. This is uh, not just my work. You know, I should say that we have had extensive conversations about this, not just with um, Dave and, and John Jackson, but also Dr. Mike pa Mark Paperk from the Shot Center and um, Dr. Scott Ensing. So, you know, it's a combined effort. Uh, so goals um, provide an, uh, an index or goals of this index to provide an indicator of the water quality conditions at, the monitor at each monitoring station, but then also uh, faci facilitate the interpretation of uh, continuous conductivity, temperature, and turbidity data from uh, your monitoring stations. Uh, and really the goals of today's presentations, uh, presentation is to update you all in this, you know, this idea, um, share with you what you're doing, what, you, what we're thinking, and hopefully get some feedback um, about you know, your, your thoughts about this, uh, whether or not you find this index to be a useful tool or not. And what advantages and disadvantages you um, may see. <clears throat> and like I said, this is just a starting point. Um, we've been actually uh, working on this for a while and there has been a number of uh, iterations on this work and we will continue to do this. Um, hopefully we'll get somewhere at some point. <laughs> So the idea, the general idea would be um, that we would be able to generate something that looks like this. This is a mock report that we would provide the groups that are participating in the, uh, that are part of the um, uh, DI, um, sorry, Enviro DIY uh, monitoring network. So in this case, again, this is just an example of um, mock site um, and code and just some fake coordinates. And, you know, I gave it a name to the group and so on. And so the this kind of report would include some general statistics uh, for a given year, um, water temperature, electric conductivity, turbidity, the highest, lowest base flow average conditions, um, storm flow average, oral average, things like that. And then um, something that may look like, you know, something like this, where you would have <clears throat> four parameters. And this, again, could change, but I'll, I'll show you what I have right now based on these four parameters. One of them is uh, calculated based on temperature. Two of them are calculated based on the um, electric conductivity, and one of them uh, based on turbidity. Um, I will explain how each of these is calculated, but just here's sort of like a you know, summary of what they 
would be indicating. Um, summer temperature exceedance is uh, an indicator based on um, or targeting, targeting fish habitat, winter and storm flow, um, electric conductivity maxima that would be related to <clears throat> road sold runoff, um, summer base flow, electric conductivity exceedance that may could be interpreted as groundwater salt contamination, and then an annual turbidity exceedance that is um, uh, related to fish and invertebrate habitat. Then there's a value here, uh, which in this case, for example, um, 50 days, is, this would mean that of the 60 days of the summer, and again, I'll go into how we calculated all this, you know, how many days out of the 60 days of the summer that site exceeded the this um, threshold of a fish habitat, which for a while, what I will show you will be 19 degrees Celsius. Um, so is this in this um, fake site, 50 days out of those 62 days, um, the summer temperature exceeded um, 19 Celsius. And so then there is a ranking. And this ranking is based on the number of sites that would have been included in the 2021 data set. <clears throat> and so on and so forth. I won't go into this because I want to first explain what each of uh, each of these mean. But that would be the idea. The idea is to give you sort of like a, a an average value for each of these uh, parameters, and then how you your station ranks among the other stations. <clears throat> so I'll explain which which uh, each of these three or four um, parameters would be. The number of summer days when temperature exceeds uh, cold water free cold water fish threshold. Uh, that's the first one, and this is based on the Pennsylvania deep or yeah Pennsylvania DP um, water quality standards for the summer. And in this case, summer I am I am only considering July and August. So from July first through August thirtieth, um, <clears throat> temperature should be or is a uh, recommended to be no, no higher than 66 Fahrenheit, which is um, 19 Celsius. Um, and so the idea is uh, we take the data, we calculate the daily average of the temperature for those uh, days of July and August. Each, each day, the average gets calculated, or yeah, for each day, the average is calculated. And then that average is, uh, uh, com um, compared with that 19 uh, degrees Celsius um, threshold or um, recommendation. So just to give you an idea, I suppose that you guys don't know what your site code is, but so this might not be very informative for you. Hopefully some of you know the, you know, which, which, what this means. Do I know what this, what this means, Dave? Yeah, most folks who have stations should know, but they may not know what other people's stations are. Sure, yeah. Well, my bad. I should have put actual names on these. But just a general idea, and I should um, go, or, uh, go back a little bit. I did this using 2020 data, which was what we had, the most complete data sets where um, summer and winter data were at least 75% complete for uh, per site. And so, if your site in 2020 had more than 75% complete summer and uh, winter data, it would be in this um, analysis. If not, then it's not here. So there were 41 sites in that category, and this is what I'm showing you. And so basically, this is you know how many <clears throat> days of the summer the 19 Celsius uh, threshold is exceeded, and this site it, it was never exceeded. For this site and the last site here, 100% or 60 days out of the 60 days or 62 days actually out of the 62 days that summer threshold was exceeded. Um, next, next category or parameter is the number of summer days at base flow that electric conductivity is um, exceeds over a modeled quote unquote natural um, eco or, um, electric conductivity. Uh, this is using again summer data in base flow conditions, and the comparison is against uh, the um, Olson and Cormier model, 
which um, you may be familiar with. Um, this is the, pub the original publication from 19 or 2019. Uh, Olson and Cormier from the US EPA used a basically uh, all the, a lot of the conductivity data that was available across the United States and um, basically separated which sites would be uh, not influenced by human activity since which where and use the ones that were considered more natural as a guidance, they developed a model for the entire United States. So we extracted those data for our region and compared base low summer conditions to that um, threshold. Um, and so basically from the data from July and August in 2020, in this case, we would average every day's um, conductivity, excluding anything that would be a storm, so it's just base flow, and um, the, that average is compared against that um, considered natural um, electric conductivity. <clears throat> if you've ever seen, there's actually there's a natural GIS layer that you can look at with the with this model. This is for our region. Uh, of course, this may or may not include the entire DR, um, the Little River Basin, but just to give you an idea, um, the every single stream here, these lines are, are stream networks and conductivities are supposed to be anything between zero and for the most part, maybe 250. And there are some caveats with this, and I'm sure you guys are thinking uh, about them right now. Uh, we can uh, discuss them later. Uh, so these would be the results for 2020 for those 41 sites. <clears throat> The number and so the graph shows that the number of days that that threshold was exceeded. Um, in the these sites here at the end, which don't have any data, is because for those particular sites we were not able to extract uh, natural quote unquote conductivity value. So there are sites that exceed that value about you know thirty five days, and other sites which exceeded almost um, all summer for most of the summer. Okay, um, next one is the magnitude of the winter um, electric conductivity peaks. In this case, we only took data from the winter season, so January and February, and um, worked uh, on the data with or within a storm. So just selected the, the storms during that period and then found the maxima uh, during those uh, peaks, winter peaks, average them, and then just calculate it basically how many times that average exceeded the EPA threshold. <clears throat> and um, this is what the data looked like. Uh, the one with the highest value here, for example, this means that this side in 2020 during the winter time peaks averaged about 80 times the um, electric conductivity threshold for that site that is you know, based on the EPA model. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, okay. And then the last one, which is related to turbidity, is the duration of turbidity exceedance or uh, biological thresholds. And in this case, the thresholds we are based on a number of studies, seven that um, look at how the turbidity affects uh, fish and two um, about turbidity and invertebrates. And so using those thresholds, um, we calculated the sum of all the exceedances per year. So it's the entire year uh, of available data. And I should say that in this case, because the turbidity has a much more complicated cleaning process, there was only um, eight or nine sites for which we had um, data that was clean enough for us to be able to do this estimate. Um, so these are the, the results. Uh, so of course, you know, this is a, very, a much more limited data set in that sense. We can't compare as many sites across, but um, so what we're showing here is the hours per year that turbidity was, that um, threshold, threshold was exceeded. exceeded. Um, okay. So, we can go back to this, take a look at this again. Hopefully that um, 
makes sense now. So the parameters are right now, like I said, we are thinking of these four. Um, this table would have some sort of an explanation of what each of these parameters uh, can be used as an indicator for, what the value of your site is um, for that specific parameter and how you're ranking among the rest of the sites that had a, um, data available for that particular year or period. And what we are um, trying to do now is basically making some decisions about each particular parameter and how we um, the calculate, how we go about the calculations, what kind of modifications make sense to do. For example, you know, we've had this conversation many times about which threshold to use for temperature. Um, and then uh, finding a way to standardize the parameters so that we could hopefully add them and be able to provide a single number um, of an index that has uh, you know, a zero to, ten, to zero to ten or zero to hundred grade or score or something like that that um, could be given to each particular site. So that's all I have. Um, we can do questions now, I guess. I can. I'm gonna stop sharing so I can get to the. Okay, thanks, Diana. Um, I'm just, Paul, I'm just typing into the chat right now, answering your question about limestone. Um, um, so Paul had a question about whether the Olson and Cormier model um, accounted for limestone and carbonate. So I typed that in there. Um, I don't know, Diana, do you want to respond to that? Um, well, I mean, you, that's, you know, like what you're saying in your answer that they do, but, but it's not perfect because you, we know that, that there's definitely area, at least in, in our region, that there's areas where, um, you know, the model basically underestimated, um, the, the natural, uh, specific conductivity. So it's not perfect, you know, it's just a model. So it definitely does, it does account for uh, um, geology is just not perfect. <laughs> so yeah, so that so that model, Paul, is intended to represent the historic conductivity, um, you know, before human influence. So it really is a historic, <laughs> ideal, natural reference for conductivity, and that's they did it for this specific purpose for people to use in this way. Um, Kevin, no, you. Yeah, I have a question. Is the exceedance then based on all uh, situations before human interference or uh, just baseline local data? Yeah, the exceedance would be the, 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 the one, um, you know, parameter that we have that is for base flow during the summertime relative to that, that um, model um it is relative to the model not relative to the this you know any conditions in at the site i don't know can you repeat the question i thought i understood but maybe i didn't yeah i i seem to have a feedback can you hear me okay yeah we can hear you we can hear the feedback but we can hear you jim i don't know where it's coming from Hey, no, I'm wondering the exceedance numbers are, you know, they could be federally mandated for salt uh, conductivity, you said before that was based on before anybody was polluting the streams or dumping salt in them. Um, is, is that the, or, or just the base flow that you average over recent periods of time? Right, so it's um, the, the summer data, the, the summer conductivity data, it, excluding um, storms, is averaged, and that's compared to the um, the model. And the model, which would be what we expect to have as previous, uh, you know, pre-human disturbances, um, and that's the two things we are comparing. What you have now in your base flow uh, during summer against that historic or um, 
yeah, pre, I guess, disturbance from human activities. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Kevin, did you have a question? McGurr? Are you muted, Kevin, if you're talking? Kevin, Kevin even on the call anymore, or did he get booted off somehow? Well, anyway, any other questions about the Diana's presentation or about the rating curves or anything else? David, I may ask, um or add what I what I would really like to I would really like to hear from you guys um, about you know what you think about this and you know whether you find it useful or valuable and worth our time and so you can obviously just email me or Dave um, or we can discuss it now but if you have thoughts that you want to share with um, you know any of us um, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I'm interested in, actually, I guess I have a more practical question, trying to get chloride strips. I tried to buy some. They seem quite expensive. Is there a cheaper source or cheaper way of getting them? I think 40 strips cost, I don't know, about 80 bucks or so. And so every time you do a test, is a couple dollars per test. Yeah. Uh, is there a lower cost way of actually measuring chloride? Well, unfortunately, they've gone up quite a bit in price. It wasn't more than half a year ago, I think, that they were around 50. Um, so they've gone up a lot. But, you know, I mean, I, I think Isaac Walton League is still providing people with strips. They're probably not going to provide you with a whole lot, but they are providing people with free strips if you sign up for their winter watch program. Um, they're certainly going to expect you to log your data on their website and, and such if you do that. Um, but I mean, I think those chloride strips are still the lowest cost method for getting chloride data, and they seem to be quite accurate up to a certain point. You know, if you're getting into the range of <laughs> some of these ridiculous spikes in the winter, you, you may max out even on the high, high end, high range strips. But otherwise, they, if you use them correctly, they, they really seem to be quite accurate. Yeah, I, I bit the bullet and ordered 80 from Hack, and then they shipped them someplace South Carolina. So ah. it, it was a frustrating experience. The other question I would have, could you, is there any way of just using pool chloride test kits? Now, I have a pool, you put a, three drops in, you compare the color, uh, it, it, would that, be sufficiently accurate? I mean, I think that's chlorine, Jim. Oh, had nothing to do with chloride. Right. Okay. Um, I have a question for your index, for the index that Diana is trying to prepare. Go for it, Carol. Okay, thanks. Is there, um, I'm trying to understand it in terms of which biota one, are most at risk for this total index? Is this going to have the biggest impact on fish, on sedimentary um, biota? On you know, is there is there a view of uh, what this total index will? Um, I'm sorry, I'm asking the question really, really poorly. Um, is there? Um, does it describe a risk for a certain level of species within the stream? Um, prey, predator, yeah. No, Carol, no, I mean, unfortunately, no. The, you know, this is a very, I would say, um, it, I guess rough, right? Like in the sense that we're not refining the data to look at any specific group or anything like that. I mean, except for, I guess the turbidity and the temperature are more to, are, are more um, directed towards uh, fish and well, cold water fish and, and macroinvertebrates with the turbidity. 
but it's not a you know it's it's not a like a um uh, yeah like we i don't think we can specifically say you know with this index or with this number if the number is below this you, all your fish are going to be happy or all your macrovertebrates are going to be happy like no i don't think we can stretch it that that far or i was thinking from the pragmatic level of if you have an index of a certain level then you need to you know you uh, if you're looking for strategies to improve the stream health, you know, you, you it really compels you to look at, but you could break it down perhaps and say if your temperature is the, is if you're most out of range for temperature or most out of range for conductivity, it might lead you to what strategies you, yeah. Right, yes, that, that's absolutely right. And that's, you know, we, again, we've gone sort of back and forth between the idea of having a, a like a single number versus, and I think we're now more inclined towards generating something that just shows the different categories independently because of exactly that same reason. It's if you can see, oh, you know, my temperature is the one thing that is really wrong in my site. My conductivity is okay. So I don't have to worry too much about um, pollution, sort of like generally salt pollution, but which we know is associated also with not, not only necessarily road salt, but can incorporate a lot of um, the issues of land use. And then you can focus on the temperature, right? Like, oh, maybe I need to put buffers or um, yeah, focus on uh, things that may improve temperature conditions. Um, so in that sense, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Is that, the, is that what you're working, is that the goal that you're working towards with this instrument, with this index? What, what are you working towards with this index? Yeah, I mean, that, um that and then sort of being able to provide um facilitate i think is for the the we i think that we have groups that may be more or less involved and some that are going to be uh you know more into like i'm gonna analyze all my data and look at every single thing under the earth about me my data and make all those conclusions but for those people who, who may not have that time or that interest is just provide a summary thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, something that also allows them to compare how they, their site looks against other sites and make some general decisions like what you're describing. But um, we, we don't want people to think that this is a, you know, like a silver bullet that is going to, going to be the answer to understand how to solve all the problems in your watership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, the, the number one question I run into when encountering the, the general public uh, when I'm out doing, you know, sensor maintenance or something like that is, is the water good? You know, a simple question that's got a, a, a difficult answer. And uh, um, there would be value in being able to say, yeah, it's, it's good for the fish. Uh, but a lot of times people want to know, is it good to drink? Because, uh, you know, we deal with the brandy wine and the white clay and the red clay. Um, which are the drinking water sources for a lot of Northern Delaware. Um, so uh, some human impact um, metric and then some impact on uh, biota, fish and, and macroinvertebrates for those that get more involved. But a lot of times it's just, <laughs> should I drink the tap water? Yeah, that's a good point, Jeff. Thanks for bringing that up about the drinking water. Could, would it be possible to clarify the situation where you're seeing such high chloride levels where you said it's higher than, than seawater? I mean, maybe, is there some background information on what site that is and, and how that's even possible? So that so that that site ID, Alex, which you can just go to monitor and put that in, put that site ID in the search bar is push one S, P-U-S-H-1-S. Um, that stream is a headwater stream and it is fed by underwater, I mean by pipes that are draining a commercial, a broad commercial area. So essentially when that stream daylights, um, it is, um, all it's receiving is um, all the water that is draining that heavily paved uh, urban area. And so 
it basically is just always running high. It's, it's running all the time seemingly above 300 or so milligrams per liter chloride, uh, 1200, 1300, 1400 conductivity. And during storms, I mean, it's not every storm that it's hitting 100,000, but one or two storms, it went over 100,000. And then a lot of others, it was between 30 and 60. Um, and that pretty much is just because there's so much salt coming in, um, you know, from all of the storm drains and such. I mean, presumably from all the storm drains and such that are in that commercial area that's where there's parking lots and roads and um, stores and so on and so forth. So if I understand that correctly, it, it, does that commercial area have MPDS permits? Do they have basins or is it just like a point source discharge from all the stormwater in, in I mean, this, that that's, area? That's a good question. I mean, it doesn't, it, it, you know, that salt isn't, doesn't get, doesn't really, it isn't processed whether the stormwater goes into basins or not. So even if it's in, even if it's sitting in a basin and just infiltrating, it's going to come out in the groundwater. But presumably, because it's, we're seeing it as quick spikes when it gets super high, it's just direct, you know, it's just direct runoff. Um, Jeff, who spoke earlier, works on a couple streams that drain a similar type of commercial area, um, which have seen spikes up to sixty thousand or so. Um, so there are more than there's more than one stream and some of these groups Ryan uh, who who owns this who TT took any to Coney Frankfurt watershed um, partnership um, they own that station and uh, we're Stroud Center is working with them in doing some uh, snapshot conductivity work like I talked with you about Alex um, to kind of really drill down on other streams in their watershed that may be, you know, in this same type of situation with just super toxic conditions in the winter and chronic toxic conditions throughout the year. Bye, Paul. I, I'd love to see, like, make, make a case of this and see if, you know, because it's just so obscenely high. It's not yeah. just high. It, it's, 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 I, I'm having a difficult time comprehending exactly how, what the situation is there. Is it like 20, 30, like, a, I guess my first question is what of the watershed, what percentage is impervious? And then B, does it have MPDS permits? Or was this one of those shopping centers built back in like the seventies where they just kind of built wherever they felt like? And then, yeah, and then and maybe C, is it possible to try to get the EPA to that site to make, a, make an example out of it? Well, you know, if, if I, we can certainly talk with Ryan and Julie at TTF about that and see what they think. If you'd like to kind of, you know, do that type of conversation, I think that would be productive. But in answer to your question about imperviousness, yes, it's about a, it's, I would guess that it's at least 80%, if not 90 or even close to 100 impervious surface upstream of where this station is. Now the, there's a station a little ways downstream of this station and it still gets super high spikes, um, but not quite as high. But it, it, it as well was getting, I mean, it was getting to seawater level. It didn't double seawater, but it was getting to seawater level as well, further downstream. I could just imagine a situation where this could be made an example of if there was enough effort behind it and maybe the landowner would be forced to retrofit basins or something just to just to prevent that point source pollutant that, that is obviously occurring there. And yeah, I mean, it's it's likely multiple, you know, business owners and, you know, public roads and so on and so forth. Um, Julian, Julian, Ryan are, I don't think either of them is on the call today, but they have certainly been getting the word out. And there was quite a bit of media coverage uh, in response to them putting out the word. You know, um, there was several radio interviews and, you know, John Jackson was interviewed uh, by the local Fox network and so on and so forth. Um, 
So, you know, I, I think the conversation is ongoing and I know you're working with similar types of questions, albeit with <laughs> less extreme toxicity issues. Um, so if, um, you know, we can certainly continue that conversation outside of this meeting. Um, we are well past 3.30 at this point. Anything, uh, and we've had half the group drop off at this point. So um, any other questions from anyone? Any other issues to bring up or any other questions for Deanna? David? Yes, Tom? Um, when we took the uh, chloride readings, we uh, provided some grab samples at the same time. Yeah. And I'm just curious what other metrics uh, you might be gathering from those grab samples. So those are going to have more comprehensive cation and anion analyses done on them. So meaning there's going to be the, the positive ions, the sodium, the magnesium, the calcium, the potassium, as well as there will be nutrients done. I mean, that's just going to that's probably not going to tell us a lot about the salt, but nonetheless, we'll get that information. And there will be another chloride number generated. So we'll be able to compare that to the chloride strip measurements to make sure that the strips are indeed giving us accurate readings. And unfortunately, it just takes a while to get those results back. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, I am going to stop recording then. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the week. <laughs>